Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Monday, November 12th, 2018. On today's episode, we're going to go to the water cooler and talk about what we've been up to. Uh, this is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Serretta, and joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film Managing Editor Jacob Paul. Hello, hello. Weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And Writers White Trend Bui. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hello. How's it going, guys? <laughs> pretty good. good. Pretty good. Uh, it, it is my birthday today. It's November 12th. Uh, Yay, happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank Let's you. Let's all sing. No, 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 no. I don't think people... I definitely people... want to hear Chris sing. <laughs> yeah, just Chris. I was and... in a band. I actually was in a band, and I, did, I was the lead singer. I'll have no it. way. Oh, no you way. Really? Oh, my yes. God. No way. Do, do yeah. you I have like any recordings? Of, uh, we were called Limp Bizkit. <laughs> oh, you got us there. No, I, I really wasn't a band. I really wasn't lead singer. <laughs> what kind of band was this, Chris? I know we're getting we're getting uh, sidetracked here. It was like oh God. It's called math rock. It's like the Appleseed cast and really nerdy. Uh, it's really like music geek kind of music. So I don't I don't think anyone would like it. Do you have any MP3s of, of your band? I, I might, but I, I think I buried them in, in, oh in a shallow grave. Well, if enough people want to hear them, maybe we can get Chris to play a song in a future he, edition. You know, what he, you know what Chris should do? He should sing the theme song. <laughs> for Chris's Chris, corner. I would love it if Chris had like a really smooth crooner voice. I have a, I'm a, I have a pretty good voice. It's not, it's not, it's not awful. My voice. Anyway, I feel like I'm derailing the conversation let's talk about something else yeah yeah um well, well first of all I, I just want to thank everybody for the happy birthday wishes i'm getting more birthday wishes than i've ever seen before and i think honestly i think it's because of this podcast i think people a lot of people are listening to this podcast and uh have more of a connection with uh not just me but everybody on this podcast so i want i want to thank everybody because I, I i've been liking tweets and liking facebook things and i just don't have this sounds so bad, but I don't have time to like say, uh, say thank you to everybody. So I, I'm, I'm saying here, and I'm going to say it on uh, Twitter. Thank you, everybody who sent in uh, birthday wishes. I, I appreciate it. Um, now, 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 with uh, all, all the positive stuff, let's let's uh, let's get a little depressing now. Uh, before we get into the water cooler, we have a bit of news to relay. Something that just uh, hit before we started recording, and that is that comic book legend stanley is dead jacob uh you wrote up an obituary for the site what do we know oh we know that stanley uh has passed away at the age of 95 the news came from tmz who reports that lee was rushed to cedars uh cedar sinai medical center in los angeles uh the cause of death has not been revealed but he's been ill for several years he's been battling with pneumonia he's been having uh eyesight problems so while this is definitely sad news, it's not necessarily, you know, it's not a surprising, shocking death. He was a 95-year-old man. He was sick. And it just, it was his time. It's, you know, it's very sad news. But I think we're all familiar with the basic legacy of Stan Lee, the man who uh, defined what Marvel Comics was in the 60s and therefore defined so much of what modern pop culture is as a result. Uh, he was born December 22nd, 1922 as Stan Lee Martin Lieber. And it's... Uh, one thing I remember learning from um, the Untold History of Marvel Comics book, which is very good, is that he he went by Stan Lee in the comic industry because he wanted to save his real name uh, for the great American novel he would one day write. And he ended up being defined by Stan Lee instead of Stanley Lieber. But he sort of backed into comics. He sort of fell into them as a, as a job to do while he pursued writing those novels, a job to do while he got his act together elsewhere, and he just stayed in it. And eventually became editor in chief of Timely Comics, which became Marvel Comics. And then in 1961, he co created the Fantastic Four with artist Jack Kirby. And they were the first superheroes to have flaws. They were human. They bickered. They argued. They didn't have great lives. And it struck a chord with people. And you see this with the rest of uh, the characters that Stan Lee would uh, create over the next decade. And that's Spider Man, Doctor Strange, the Incredible Hulk, the X Men, Iron Man, Ant Man, Thor, Daredevil, Black Panther. It's just Lee uh, acting as editor-in-chief of Marvel while writing these comics, while working with this astonishing uh, parade of talent. Like, the, the number of people working in Marvel at this time, 
it's just this cavalcade of amazing names and Lee as a as a manager and as a writer and as a creative person and a businessman was wrangling it all and making Marvel happen and all these characters um, came from him and some other, some other people. It's just this one of the most important creative decades in American pop culture history, bar none. No matter what the, how you feel about superheroes, this is like one of those groups of people who changed fundamentally the way we view fiction in America and worldwide in pop culture. Uh, once you leave this decade, Lee's legacy gets a little more, a little stranger. Once he becomes publisher of Marvel instead of uh, editor in chief, he stops writing. He becomes uh, a businessman, starts trying to bring Marvel to Hollywood, fails, fails trying to do it in the eighties, and he stops being like an actual creative force in Marvel. Starts being more the figurehead, the mascot, the the guy who everyone thinks runs Marvel when he's just sort of there at the, the front, smiling and offering that devil may care attitude that was so important to his public persona. I know in recent years, thanks to um, cameos and lots of movies from Kevin Smith, put him in Mallrats, who him showing up in all these Marvel movies and small uh, supporting roles in cameos. He's become like the go-to, you know, comic creator that everybody knows. Like everybody who goes to the movies knows Stan Lee, even if they don't know, you know, Jack Kirby or everyone else he worked with. And it's definitely a, he has a he has, he has a messy legacy now because he's been accused of hogging credit of not giving the proper due to the writers and co-creators. He's been uh, people as many, for everyone who says that he was as warm and as inviting a collaborator as possible, or somebody else who accuses him of not giving credit or credit is due. So we deal with a guy who is known for cameos these days, but ha- has his legacy looms so much larger than that. And we're going to be unpacking what he's done to pop culture, positive and negative, for years to come. Uh, but the man's a legend, and there's no getting around that. And I never had a chance to meet him, but I know someone on our staff at least spoke to him, right, HD? Yeah. In the lead-up to um, Avengers Infinity War, I got the chance to talk to him only on the phone. But it was a really exciting time for me because this is when I was just first starting out to write in entertainment journalism. And this was a big interview. And... Um, I think it was in promotion for some like energy drink tie-in to Avengers Infinity War, and and the and they required me to ask at least like one question about this energy drink or whatever merchandise this was. <laughs> so I I I, wrote, I asked that it was something dumb. I can't even remember what it was, but it was so cool to talk to him, and he was so sweet even though he couldn't hear half of what I was saying, and I think that was half you know the phone, but also half that he was. Like very elderly man, so at the end I asked him to say Excelsior uh, to like close out the conversation, and he did. After I asked him several times, <laughs> um, I I don't think I've read any of like the you know the early Marvel comics. I I kind of got into the bandwagon in the the nineties, but I mean any everybody knew who Stanley was, and I I think I uh, you know really got a connection with him with that mall rats cameo or is it even a cameo i think that's like a full-fledged appearance right at that point i mean compared to his other cameos and um uh i remember when i was uh young i I wanted to be an artist i wanted to be a comic book artist and i had these tapes there was a series of tapes where stan lee would team up with uh comic book artists i think mostly people from like image comics and they would like create a character and show you how like the process of stuff and there was this one where uh him and rob liefeld at the time created like some kind of i think they created cable or something um in the in this vhs taste i would watch it over and over again and try to learn you know what it takes to be to create a character that you know like in the iconic level that stanley uh can create i i, I do think most people nowadays probably only know stanley from these cameos uh you know the comic book world obviously knows who stanley is but most people know him as the guy that makes the cameo and i, I am so glad that marvel studios when they started out started to do that because i feel like uh if they hadn't, this death would uh, would not be taken as greatly as it is online. Like uh, I'm, I'm just seeing like the outpouring on my Twitter feed is insane. It's like you know, I feel like uh, you know this guy has touched many lives more. I mean, it obviously he touched the lives with these characters he created, but uh, people really 
feel like they knew him. And I never interviewed Stanley, but I did get to meet him uh, at an event promoting Comic Con the movie, which is this documentary that he appears in. And he he was just so nice and so uh, great. And uh, the only thing I regret is not getting a photo with Stan at that time. But um, do do any oh. of I actually like to correct myself because I said Avengers Infinity War is for Avengers Age of Ultron. So uh, that was my mistake, yeah. Um, ben, Chris, Brad, do you, do, do you any of you have any experiences in uh, with, with Stanley growing up? Um, I I mean, the sp- uh, I guess one of the Spider-Man comics that he wrote um, about Sandman, I don't remember the exact one, but that was the first comic that I ever read. Um, so I, I was introduced to... Uh, to an entire medium by, you know, somebody who was like a king of the, of that medium. So that was kind of a special experience. Um, I I mean, I never had a chance to interview him or meet him or anything like that as well. But uh, yeah, as Jacob said, he has like a complicated legacy now, I think, but, um, but yeah, I mean, obviously he was a, he was a Titan, you know, he's, he's one of those guys that, um, that changed, (laughs) that basically changed everything. So uh, despite the, um, the accusations of uh, of theft and and allegations and all of that kind of stuff in terms of like uh, you know stealing characters or not giving credit where it was due and all that stuff. I think there's enough there that even with that complicated stuff um, attached to his name, that there's uh, there's uh, he's done enough work that that is like verifiable and and um, you know uh, that stands on its own that that is enough enough to be uh, celebrated by everybody. And spearheading a very progressive Marvel, you know, comics in a time when I think, uh, you know, it would have been easier to be more conservative. Um, Brad, do you have any uh, remember memories of Stanley? No, I mean, it's the, the impact that he had on me is really just the same that he's he's had on everybody else is, you know, creating these characters that captivated me as a childhood and up through my adult life now. Uh, unfortunately, I never got a chance to to meet or interview Stanley. I, and like, there was always a part of me whenever I was like at a convention or something where he was nearby. I was like, man, I really should probably just go and like go meet Stanley and get something signed by him, just because like it would be there would just be a, a nice thing to have. And I I never did it, and I you know obviously I, re- I regret it for sure uh, and can't do it now. So that's that's definitely a bummer. But it's. You know, he he lived a long uh, life and, you know, made this great impact on a lot of people. And, you know, you you really just can't, uh, you know, overstate how important he has been to uh, pop culture at large. Chris, any thoughts? I mean, I don't have any personal stuff. I just I was always aware of Stanley. Even I don't really even know how I first became aware of him. I, I had a. um a book growing up that was, it was called like how to draw comics the Marvel way. And even though he wasn't an artist, there was, you know, like a whole thing about him in there. And I think that's where I first learned about him. And I was just always aware of him ever since. I completely forgot about that book. I, I also own that book. It's Um, great. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It was a great book. Uh, Jacob, I mean, you said, I think a lot in your, in your, your your news rundown of this, but do you have any uh, personal uh, thoughts to le- lead us off with this? I I go back and forth on Stanley. I know enough people who knew him personally to, to say like he was just a wonderful, wonderful man. Then you hear all the stories about uh, of of him not ne- of him not necessarily um, sharing the spotlight well. But it's a case where if you go back and look at his actual comics and if you go back and look at his dialogue and, and storytelling in relation to other comics at the time, n- no one did more to push forward what comics could be. The dialogue in Fantastic Four and Spider-Man in those early days is maybe a little hokey by modern standards, but so much more nuanced and better than everything else at that time. I mean, it's rare to find someone who defines a medium as much as Stan Lee did and and as messy as his legacy can be, his legacy is one where he stepped up and took an entire medium of art and pushed it to a new level. I mean, we literally would not have comics or even movies um, as we had in the day without Stan Lee. It's just someone much smarter than me will one, will one day write the book <laughs> explaining all the webs and connections uh, from Stan Lee's days at Marvel uh, to now in pop culture. But it, it, one of the most important storytellers in American history and possibly even world history. Well said. Uh, we should get into the water cooler. We should move on. Um, 
let's start off with what we've been doing. Uh, I haven't been doing much this week. I did uh, last week. I I have a uh, the original iPad Air, which I think came out like the second year or third year of the iPads, uh, and it's very outdated. It runs really slow. I used to use it all the time to read comics and uh, to actually on my set visits and and everything. I, I it was a I, I used it so much, but now it's almost unusable. So I was waiting for a new iPad to come out for actually a few years now. And I was waiting for a new form factor. Apple last week came out with new iPads. Uh, so I decided to, to bite the bullet and buy the 13-inch iPad. This thing's, like, huge. And um, I uh, I had it for a few days. I realized – I mean, Apple's really promoting – this thing as it could replace your work computer like it, it is actually probably almost as fast as my macbook pro um and uh, the, the size of the screen 13 inches is almost the size of my macbook pro and uh but i i could not find it as a as a a replacement for my work like i couldn't record this podcast uh on that thing and uh writing stories is not uh, easy on an ipad i, I think i use I think my use case for iPads, I think there's two use case for iPads. There's uh, people who create like artists who use like that pencil thing. And then there's, uh, then there is the, uh, the people who consume with their iPads. I like to read comics. I, you know, put movies on there. I put TV shows while I'm working out and I, you know, I, when I'm traveling and stuff like that, I read scripts. Uh, So I'm, I'm an iPad consumer and uh, I found within a few days of owning this device, that uh, 13 inches for an for an iPad for a tablet is just too much. So I actually over the weekend went to the Apple Store and returned my iPad, and I di- I did buy the new 11 inch iPad. So I do have a new iPad, and I'm enjoying that a lot more. It's not as heavy to hold up in bed and like 13 inches. Uh, even though it's only two more inches than like a normal iPad, is it, it just too much. So uh, I'm playing around with this. I, I think I'm a lot more happy with this uh, this 11 inch iPad. But uh, literally, I've been doing nothing this week, so I had to talk about something. So there you go. There, there's my uh, review of the new iPad. Uh, Jacob, what have you been up to? I had a pretty lazy weekend, but Friday evening I went to the new. Uh, hope I pronounced the name correctly. I've re- never really said it out loud. Uh, Laurent Duro show at the Mondo Gallery. Uh, Duro is extremely popular uh poster artist he's only been doing posters for about five years or so but he's like exploded in those years he's he does these extremely detailed um beautiful sometimes very subtly witty uh pop culture posters uh and this is his second solo show at the mondo gallery in austin and it was a really good show and in the show notes i've included a link to our article where i actually interviewed him by email about every poster in the show. He had Planet of the Apes, Ex Machina, Ghostbusters, Conan the Barbarian, um, two posters for The Shining, just a really good collection of stuff. And it's a really strong show. And if you're in Austin and you go to Mondo Gallery while it's open, uh, you should definitely go check it out. There's some beautiful stuff there as well as some originals, some of his early sketches and uh, early proofs that are for sale as well for a great deal of money, but they are nice to look at. And I spent some money there if you're a family member of mine you may be getting a gift of a laurent duro poster this holiday season otherwise i picked up um his 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 the shining poster which i didn't love when i first saw online but fell in love with in person in in ways that i feel sometimes the best posters actually work on you so that's been added to my house already but yeah it it was a really good show and uh and it's their their second time on slash film doing uh, a mondo gallery opening where we got commentary from the artists on all the posters so i hope you guys enjoy them because i'm talking to mondo about maybe making this a regular thing so if you guys like it let me know well let's link both the uh the posters and and your your feature piece in in the show notes so people can find that stuff um ht you have had a very exciting week you you have moved to new york city yeah so i officially moved to New York City this past Saturday and it's been a whirlwind uh, of just packing and moving and coming up here and thankfully my roommate Rebecca was already here and settled by the time I got here so I, ca- I didn't really have to do much work <laughs> just lug all my stuff up um, but I'm waiting on for like some of my big 
pieces of furniture, which is like my bed, for example. So I'm like sleeping on an air mattress right now. Um, but yeah, it's it's been surreal. I'm kind of like talking about really random stuff that is popping up and makes it sound less exciting than it is, but it's quite exciting. And um, uh, I also got to see the fancy duck at Central Park that has um, taken New York by storm. I think it was a good way to sort of um, to start off my New York adventures, so to speak. Uh, I went to Central Park and hung out there with some of my, some of my cousins who live here. And uh, I saw the fancy duck on the way and then just kind of been out and about just shopping for my apartment and, you know, roaming around my neighborhood, which is in Queens. I, I said that before, but I really love my, my neighborhood. It's so sweet. And uh, it has so many restaurants and bars and a Chinese grocery store nearby, uh, which is closer than like I've ever had a Chinese grocery store. It has tons of ingredients that are ripe for me to cook um, at least Vietnamese uh, dishes, which I haven't really had the chance to do before. But now I have no excuse because it's right there and I <laughs> need to actually I, sh I want to like start cooking Vietnamese food. So that's very exciting. And um, yeah, I've just been settling in and um, right now I'm waiting for like my packages to be delivered and uh, it's just, moving is fun. Yeah, moving is fun. <laughs> you make it sound like fun. And, and I'm so jealous of you. You're hanging out at uh, Central Park on the weekend. I don't know. I wish I, <laughs> I wish I had lived in New York City at one point in my life. But uh, I, I, think, I yeah. think I'm too old at this point. I'm, well, you, you can do whatever you want. Peter. Yeah. You can, you can like reach for the stars. <laughs> uh, I'm actually only like a mile and a half away from the Museum of um, Moving Pictures, too. I think that's what it's called. Yeah. yeah. Of Motion Pictures? Yes. I think so. Yeah. Museum of uh, Moving Image? Is that what you're A Moving Image. Sorry. Yes. That place is that great. One. Yes. So I'm excited to, to visit that for the first time. And yeah, this is a very exciting movement for me because I've also like lived in the Washington, D.C. area my entire life. Um, and uh, I've wanted to move here and do this move for a, a long time and just and just excited to explore that and start a new chapter, so to speak. Well, very exciting. Uh, let's move on to what we've been watching. Uh, last week, I saw Overlord, the bad robot movie produced by J.J. Abrams. Uh, J I think Jacob previously talked about this on the podcast, uh, so I won't get too far into it. But this is the movie that takes place during World War II. It's a uh, uh, you know zombie war movie, I guess, is what they're promoting it as. I almost wish that they did not have to reveal that conceit in the marketing, but I guess there's no way. I almost wish filmmakers and screenwriters would think, when they're writing a f story, would think of the way of how is this going to have to be promoted because I feel like the discovery of where it goes is kind of, you know, handled as a reveal, but all the marketing is kind of around that. I, I feel like I would, it would have been cooler to go into it, you know, just thinking it was a horrifying war film that has some kind of weird, uh, you know, mysterious twist to it than knowing where it's actually going. But honestly, that did not, uh, you know, damper this for me. I, I like this movie starts as a tense, terrifying, elevated war movie and becomes a brutal, bloody, and bonkers B horror movie. And I, I really enjoyed it. I, uh, I was shocked. I actually thought I was not gonna like this movie, and I really had a lot of fun with it. I think, uh, the opening sequence is very thrilling, and I feel. Not that I know anything, but I feel like J.J. Abrams' fingerprints are all over that sequence. It like feels like a very J.J. Abrams thing, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's yeah, I would recommend it. So, uh, Overlord, go see it. Um, also, I have um, uh, over the past week, I have gotten addicted to a new YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is Becky and Chris. I will link it in the show notes. I found them through another YouTube channel I follow, Peter McKinnon. Uh, and ba basically, Becky and Chris are um, they're from Newfoundland, Canada. They moved to New York. They're in Buffalo, New York. Uh, they are – he is a doctor. She is a uh, graphic designer. And uh, they do one video blog every week where they go on kind of crazy trips. They're, they're photographers. They're like, it's very stylish and very well shot. And it's almost, um, uh, 
our own Ben Pearson does these video blogs of his vacations. And I feel like this is almost uh, like what if Ben and his wife were doing a video blog every week and, and they were more hipster. This is what it would. <laughs> this is what it would be. Um, it, it's a lot of fun. It's just like so well shot and so well. They have drones. They have like multiple cameras, and it, it, like you get to learn about photography. And they're just such likable, interesting people. He's, you know, he's learning to fly a helicopter. So you go on that journey with him. And I binged through uh, a few years of their videos over the past years, <laughs> but. Uh, Actually, Ben, I would recommend you check it out. I think uh, yeah. you would admire the cinematography of this and uh, how they put everything together. They go through it. It's kind of interesting. Um, Jacob, what have you been watching? Well, I kicked things off uh, this past weekend by watching The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, the David Fincher version. And that movie holds up. Uh, I don't think the mystery on paper is that interesting or that good, uh, but somehow... Uh, Fincher and his team managed to make it into something so weird and compelling and gross. And the whole thing is like taking a, a, a shower in muck. And I really love it for that reason. And I think Rooney Mara and Daniel Craig have an anti-chemistry that really works somehow. It makes those uh, disparate characters, the straight-laced middle-aged journalists and this uh, young, um, socially awkward, possibly deranged uh, hacker their, their relationship works in a way that I don't think it has a right to work nearly as well as it does. And it's, it's my wife's favorite movie, not called Lord of the Rings. So we watch it pretty regularly and it always holds up. But the reason we, we watched it was because uh, we were going to go see the girl in the spider's web, the, the new dragon tattoo story as it's being subtitled on all the posters. And if you do go see the girl in the spider's web, I do not recommend rewatching the girl, with the dragon tattoo first, because it's not a fair comparison. Uh, the Girl in the Spider's Web might as well be called Studio Notes, the movie. Everything that was interesting or grungy or sharp-edged about the original movie has been sanded down to a, to a so, so, so smooth and palatable. And I guess a good way to sum this up is that uh, whereas Elizabeth Salander, uh, as by Rudy Mara and directed by David Fincher, was this genuinely unhinged, um, difficult to understand um possibly psychotic woman who whose face is full of piercings all like i think she has four or five piercings whose fashion sense is terrible and just who carries herself like a like a bag of bricks has been transformed into this sleek well-dressed action hero who has one very um stylish facial piercing that you can barely see really good fashion sense really good haircut she carries guns all the time and gets in lots of shootouts and action scenes and car chases so when they transform this really fascinating character into a very generic action hero and everything about her that was intentionally maybe off-putting or odd has been completely removed. I mean, it's genuinely insulting. And they replaced Daniel Craig with this baby-faced guy who doesn't have any of the years or charisma that you want from that character. And Fede Alvarez, the director, he, 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 it's fine. He has a fine job directing it. I like his other two movies, Evil, Evil Dead remake and Don't Breathe, but... I feel like this is just a, him taking a studio job, <laughs> and, and it's it's a competent action movie, and Claire Foy does what she can with this really sanded down Elizabeth Slander, but it's just, I know Sony's whole thing was, the original Dragon Tattoo was extremely expensive, and it was a two and a half hour long feel bad mystery, so their attempt to make a you know more palatable two hour long action film has resulted in a movie that has nothing interesting going on, and this it's just so boring. And the, the one highlight for me was Lakeith Stanfield, who shows up playing uh, an American agent who gets wrapped up in, in Elizabeth's uh, quest. And he's making choices. <laughs> like every Lakeith Stanfield performance, he's making his choices and sticking by them. But I just can't help but think about how there's a scene in Dragon Tattoo where Dale Craig's character has a, has a revelation. And the camera pushes in on his face as he looks into a computer screen and realizes something. And that reaction shot is more thrilling than all the expensive action in this reboot. And so that, that should say a lot. <laughs> action does not matter uh, when characters don't matter. And the original one understood that. Anyway, I also rewatched Apostle because my wife hadn't seen it. And uh, I talked about this during Fantastic Fest coverage. I like Apostle. I think it's too, I think it's too long. I think the length um, is more palatable on a revisit when you're kind of prepared for the saggy midsection. 
but it's a good movie, and I feel like because it was dumped on Netflix, no one's really talking about it. But you know, it's the director of the raid directing Dan Stevens in a horror movie, and it's good, uh, and I really like it. And my wife loved it. She even yelled at me for saying it was too long. So take from that what you will. Uh, and finally, uh, I watched way too much of the Great British Baking Show. Uh, last week, I talked about how I finally started season five of the show. Uh, over the weekend, I finished season five. Uh, went back and watched the early season Netflix just added under uh, Great British Baking Show, The Beginnings. And then I started the new, brand new season six uh, and watched the first half of that. So my weekend was all about extremely pleasant British people making uh, goods. That was what I did. Very cool. And uh, Chris, what have you been watching? Uh, I had a surprisingly busy weekend where I caught up on movies. I mean, I say busy in quotes because watching movies isn't busy. I'm just a lazy man. But um, Hey, you're doing so, more than me sitting on a couch watching YouTube videos. <laughs> so, so my wife and I watched all of Amazon's new series, Homecoming, with Julia Roberts. Um, it's from... How do you say his name? Sam Ismail, the guy who does yeah. Bad Robot. I'm not Bad Robot, Mr. Robot. <laughs> and uh, that is um, fantastic. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm not like huge into Mr. Robot. I, I like the style of it, but I, I didn't haven't kept up on it. But this show um, is really good. Uh, every episode is only like 26 to 33 minutes long, which is a, a huge plus because they don't waste time, and it's directed really well I, he directed the whole season and it, it's it looks like this like weird hitchcock david fincher brian de palma hybrid and uh one of the things i love most about it is there's no actual music created for the show all the music is taken from other movies so like there's music from halloween three there's music from uh, Escape from New York. There's music from uh, the Francis Ford Coppola movie, The Conversation. So the, I, that's just this really neat thing that I haven't really seen done before. Like, obviously, you know, Martin Scorsese and Stanley Kubrick always use source music, but that's usually just actual, like, songs. Like, th this is, like, music straight out of other movies, which I really haven't seen before, and I thought that was really neat. I, I, I do think, like, other movies have – in. in yeah, movies have probably used like themes from other scores, but not in the way that this is. This is like a mixtape. Of... Yeah, it's like entirely. Yeah, it's so cool. And and then the show itself is really fascinating. Um, Julia Roberts plays this. Uh, she's like a social worker working at this secret government uh, facility that's treating soldiers with uh, PTSD. And uh, that's at least the cover story. And there are, there are two timelines. There's one set in 2018 and there's one set in 2022. And as we see in 2022, Julia Roberts can't actually remember anything that happened in 2018. So the whole show is about her trying to piece together what happened to her in 2018. And it's just really fascinating and really well done. And it's really easy to watch because, like I said, the episodes are really short. So we finished it in like two days. We just blew through it. And um, so if, if you if anyone out there is looking for something to stream quickly, I, I highly recommend Homecoming on Amazon Prime. Does it set up for like another season or is it a one and done thing? Uh, I've heard there actually is already they already greenlit a second season. But the way it ends now, it could easily stand alone. And I've actually heard like the second season might have like completely different characters so it might be sort of like an anthology thing so it is in some respects self-contained so if you're you know I, I wish they would just do one season because i'm weird like that but it, it does work really well wait and this is based on a, based on a podcast. podcast yeah was, I the, was the podcast a true story no no, no. it's all no. fictional it's, okay. it's very it gets into like sci-fi sort of angles not really but like you know not too out there but Stuff that could never really happen, basically. Uh, what else have you been watching? Uh, so I caught up on some movies for the end of the year. Well, first I watched The, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, which is the, the Coen Brothers movie coming to Netflix, I think, this Friday. And that was good. I love the Coen Brothers. Um, this isn't – maybe this isn't, like, one of their best, but – it's it's you know it's a Coen Brothers movie. You know what you're getting. Um, it's a, it's an anthology because it was originally supposed to be a TV series, but then they edited it into a movie with individual stories. And like all anthologies, some stories work better than the rest. Um, the very first one is the best, where Tim Blake Nelson uh, plays Buster Scruggs, and he's like this singing cowboy, but he's also 
like like a serial killer. So the whole move, the whole segment is him just going from location to location and brutally murdering people while like cheerfully talking to the camera and breaking the third wall. It's 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 very strange. I haven't seen really anything much like this before. So uh, that that segment alone made the movie worth seeing. And like I said, that's coming to Netflix this Friday. Uh, the other three things I watched were I watched Blind Spotting, uh, Christopher Robin, and Black Klansman. Um, of those three, uh, Blind Spotting I think is the best. That movie really blew me away, it's, and it's it's almost impossible to really describe what that movie is because it's not like a it doesn't really have a plot. It's more like a it's like dropping you into the world of these two characters. Um, Davy Diggs, who is in Hamilton, plays this guy. Uh, who's, who's on parole and he, he he's worried that his his best friend is just going to get him in trouble again because his best friend is this like hothead who's always just doing really shitty things and just the performances and the way that movie is set up is incredible like there are scenes where characters just start like freestyle rapping in like the middle of the scenes and that sounds goofy but it works really well in the movie and uh, Christopher Robin, I liked. That was surprisingly more adult than I was expecting it to be. It was, it was a very melancholy movie, which is fine with me because I'm a very melancholy person. And the last one is Black Klansman, which what I love about this is that movie is surprisingly funny. And I wouldn't call it a comedy, but it, 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 it lets you let your guard down by being amusing. Like it plays up the comedy. Spike Lee really leans into the comedic aspects. And then the final like 10 minutes of that movie are like a punch in the face. And it just left me feeling like absolutely terrible, which is what it should do. But it just, it just let me feeling angry and depressed and disgusted with how, you know, we haven't come far at all as a society from this film, which is set in like the seventies. So uh, that, that's definitely not a feel good movie, but it's, it's one of the best movies of the year. Well, cool. Uh, Ballard, Ballard of uh, Buster Scruggs. Am I saying that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a screen for it like last week and I decided not to see it because I was like, oh, it's going to be on Netflix in a week. So, you know, I'm not going to, you know, carve out a night this week to see it in theaters. And I, I already feel bad about that. I already <laughs> feel like I'm I'm the problem. <laughs> yes. Thanks a lot, Peter. You're ruining film. <laughs> uh, Brad, what have you been watching? I have not been watching much because I've been busy with my slow, tedious move. Um, but I, di- I did get sent while I was gone in Utah. Um, I got Time Life's massive Robin Williams comic genius box set. Um, I'll be doing a more extensive review of this on Slash Film as soon as I'm done digging through the, the finer points of it. Um, but it is a comedy nerd's dream and a Robin Williams fan's, like, best you know collection you could buy it is uh it's got 22 dvds um and there's hours of stuff here there there's it has all of his stand-up specials including one that was never released it has footage from him doing uso uh tour shows it has episodes of mork and mindy it has tons of his appearances from the tonight show and jimmy kimmel it, it has appearances on random improv and uh, like comedy specials. It has um, the episodes of Inside the Actors Studio. Uh, it has appearances on Charlie Rose. It has all three of the episodes of Saturday Night Live that he appeared in in the 80s in their entirety. And these are episodes that are like impossible to get a hold of in, in pretty much any other medium, mostly because the 80s is one of the their early 80s anyway is one of the more, um, this, I, I guess, you know, um, not respected uh, times in Saturday Night Live's history. Um, well, Lorne Michaels wasn't really in charge and that kind of thing. And it's just, there's so much stuff here to dig into. Um, and it really just, like, gives you so much, like, insight into Robin Williams as a performer. And uh, it peels back the curtain a little bit because, like, when you look at so much footage that he's done, you kind of see... Uh, that he that he's he's quick wit and he has a lot of the stuff, but he also does have jokes that he falls back on, like any comedian does. You know, he realizes certain little bits or quick responses work in certain situations, uh, and he uses them to his advantage. And it's just it's such a a, a fascinating watch, and it's uh, I I've loved that you know watching all this footage that I, I hadn't seen before. And all this footage is exclusive to that box set. Not all of it. Like there's 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 a bunch of stuff that is like 
widely available. Like most of his stand-up comedy specials you can get on DVD. Um, uh, the documentary that recently premiered on HBO is on there. And like, you know, all those episodes of Mork and Mindy. But there's a lot of stuff that is exclusive to this box set uh, and, and stuff that was pulled from Robin Williams' own personal library. Like there's some r- recordings that came off of VHSs that he had in his home of shows that he did that no one had ever seen on, in public before. Oh, that's pretty incredible. Um, ben, what have you been watching? I finished uh, the Netflix original series Maniac, which I talked about um, either last week or the week before, and uh, I really enjoyed it. I, I I feel like it stuck the landing. It's one of those shows that, um, with a very it, that one, I think, as far as I understand, was a officially a limited series, so it's not coming back for anything else. It's just a, a one and done sort of season, and um, it, it's kind of amazing in the in the ways that it gives Jonah Hill and Emma Stone, who are the stars of the show so much range to play different types of characters because these the premise of the show is that they are uh, people who go into this sort of um, therapy session where it's like they're taking mind altering drugs to uh, well it, it's very complicated so I'll just leave it at that but the the drugs um, sort of take them through and allow them to change their realities in a way where they're playing basically different versions of themselves sort of like throughout time. It's, it's a difficult concept to, to really dig into, but it, in any case, it gives them a real interesting showcase. Like for Jonah Hill in particular, I feel like this is some of the best work that he's ever done. Um, it really, I mean, he, he's like uh, manic and out of control in certain ones. And he's like most of the, uh, in certain of these like realities that he experiences or his character experiences. But for most of the show, he's very quiet and reserved. And it, um, I don't know, I just thought it was a really great showcase of the range of both uh, Jonah Hill and Emma Stone. So I'd recommend digging into that. And of course, Kerry Fukunaga directed all the episodes. So it looks gorgeous as well. So that, that always helps. Um I watched Bodied. Uh, I got a screener of that. Um, this movie, I think, as far as I know, it's available on YouTube Red right now, I think. Uh, I'll have to check and get back to you on that. A little but, bit later this month. It's in limited release theaters right now. And then okay. it hits, hits YouTube, uh, I think, in, I think 22nd, but I, I need to double check that. And, and, it, and it's no longer called YouTube Red. It's now called YouTube Premium. Oh, yes. Excuse me. Yes. So there you go. Jacob and Peter coming in with the save for me. I appreciate that. Uh, Yes. So this movie is uh, is about a grad student who uh, basically discovers the world of um, of battle rapping, this sort of underground world. And it's in in its structure. It's a lot like a lot of movies that you've seen before where it has uh, it gives you a protagonist through which you can see a world that you've never experienced as an audience. And maybe like people aren't really aware of this subculture and it's very like, it gets into the nitty gritty of how this subculture works. So it's interesting from like a, almost like a um, sociological perspective, but it, this is a movie it's directed by Joseph Kahn and it is uh, it is certainly not afraid to push people's buttons. It's, it's like designed to be controversial in a lot of ways. Um, but it, it also makes some, and a lot of times when things like that happen, I sort of roll my eyes and I'm like, Oh great. You're just doing this to rile people up. Uh, you don't really have anything to add to a conversation other than just sort of like throwing a grenade into a hornet's nest. But uh, this movie, I feel like it does that, but it also has a lot of really interesting things to say about the way that, um, that outrage functions in our society in 2018. There's a lot of uh, like observations about uh, social media and like how people take things out of context and how careful everyone is all the time to basically like walk on eggshells and not say anything that could be, uh, you know, deemed as uh, culturally insensitive. And there's, there are a lot of interesting ideas hidden in this movie that um, that grapples with like language and uh, race and class and, <laughs> and all this stuff in a in a really fascinating way. It's it's a movie that I think um, is more than just what it appears to be on its surface. And Jacob, I know you've you've talked about this uh, previously in the podcast, right? Uh, yeah, I saw a Fantastic Fest last year where it was still un- didn't have distribution yet. It won the Audience Award there. It won the Audience Award at several other film festivals and. Only YouTube <laughs> was the one who was brave enough to pick it up because, as you point out, it's it's a malt of cocktail of a movie. It just wants to burn things down, but it, it burns with a with intent, not because it wants to cause destruction, because it wants to cause conversation. I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I would recommend that if you're uh, if you're okay with um, 
with being challenged a little bit. I think it's a it's a challenging movie, but it's probably worth watching. Uh, I also watched The Quiet Man, which is on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. This is a 1952 movie directed by John Ford. It stars John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara. And the reason I watched this was because when my wife and I went to uh, Ireland, we stayed in a place that is v- like basically where they filmed a lot of this movie. And I had never seen it before. And there's this really, really tiny little vi- village called Kong, which is sort of like the the main setting of the movie. And uh, we walked around there and, and saw they have like a statue erected and a bunch of uh, lo- filming locations and stuff set up where they have little plaques. And um, it, it's definitely like it's a very, very small town in Ireland. So the idea that a movie came, an American movie came and filmed there in 1952 was like a huge deal to them even still. And the movie actually was nominated for best picture. Um, I don't think it won that year, but it's interesting because I, I kind of watched this movie at a little bit of an arm's length because you're sort of watching like Irish customs as they were back in the day, but also just like societal customs in general, like the way that that men would have to court women to date them. And, you know, like the basically like the courting process before you could get married. Um, It's really sort of strange and surreal to understand that this is how people, (laughs) you know, this is how people actually lived at at a certain point, not that far away from us in our own history. the the movie is really goofy it's like you can get a sense of like uh, romantic comedy uh aspects in here like but the, <laughs> and the performances from John Wayne and Marino O'Hara are very over the top but i guess it's enjoyable in like a a sort of goofy way the movie ends with this really really long fist fight <laughs> and it sort of portrays most irish people as like drunken and like you know ready to brawl at the drop of a hat which is like i mean it's borderline offensive now but i don't think that i don't i don't think it was back then especially given the fact that this movie was nominated for best picture i it john ford actually who's best known for westerns won best director for this and the movie won uh, an oscar for best cinematography as well and it's really like it captures the landscapes of ireland really uh, wonderfully it's a, it's a beautiful movie in a lot of ways but um yeah it's 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 a rom-com that's pretty goofy um i don't imagine a lot of people have seen this one but uh where is this available uh i got it through the disc plan with netflix so i don't think it's streaming anywhere that i know of anyway but uh but that's how i checked it out um it's good ben's right it's good but it's worth saying just kind of whisper that in here <laughs> okay good i'm glad somebody else has, has seen this one uh i also saw a screening of ralph breaks the internet which i'm not going to talk too much about other than to say i did not like this movie i really love the first wreck it ralph But this one, you know how in, uh, we're just talking about Stan Lee, you know how in every Marvel movie, if you see them in the theater, there's always that one person in in your theater who, when the Stan Lee cameo comes, they freak out and lose their minds and like point at the screen and go like, there he is. Hey. And they nudge their friend. (laughs) And they're like, oh, uh, it's Stan Lee. (laughs) Always. Every single time. Ralph Breaks the Internet is an entire movie of that. And it like... (laughs) It it drove me insane. Like there are it's not that bad. Oh, Peter, this was one of the worst theatrical experiences that I've ever had. Not because of the movie, which, by the way, I think is really good. Oh, okay, you're kids. saying because of the people in your yes. theater. Yes, the people in my theater were losing their goddamn minds at every little reference to the internet. It's like so. You know, the the premise of the movie is that Ralph and Vanellope go into the internet. And they see, oh, wow, there's a Snapchat thing over there. There's an Amazon thing over there. And these people in my screening were like, oh, 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 yeah, look at that. Oh, like pointing it out, like as if this is as if they're special for noticing these things, which are like blatantly obvious in the movie. And it's like, first of all, I feel like this was a terrible idea for a sequel for this movie, because the idea of the arcade world is something that sort of has a novelty to modern audiences because we don't spend all of our time playing old arcade games from the 80s yes there's like a nostalgic factor that you know we can have a whole separate conversation about nostalgia but just the the sheer novelty of it exists right but but for them to go into the internet which is something that we all spend all day on and we're totally immersed in as a modern culture for them to use that as the setting it just 
feels like I go to the movies to escape looking at my phone and and paying attention to what's going on online, not to have all of those things, you know, just spat back out at me in like the least interesting ways possible. It's sort of my wife was saying it it reminded her of like uh inside out, how they the how they visualized the inside of a young girl's mind in that movie so wonderfully and and like it's an original kind of thing that you've never really seen before. It's like this movie tried to be inside out, but just made the most basic observations possible and didn't do anything interesting with its premise. I, I like the themes that it tries to get at at the end of the movie, but uh, man, this one, it just completely fell flat for me. So I, I was, I was not a fan of this. I, um, I do think ahead. there is going to be a significant segment of, of people that see this movie that are not going to like it like you did. Um, I, I, I definitely think it is a step down from Wreck-It Ralph, but I think, I don't know. You're right. Setting in a different world than the world of the arcade, anything was going to be a step down, I think. Um, yeah. Because like that, that is what was so interesting about that movie. Um, but I do think, I don't know. I, I do think there is enough, to enjoy and there is some more complex stuff in here uh that it, that i like uh how uh rich moore does that with his animated films it's not just like you know a film for kids like many of the uh you know illumination entertainment movies are right 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 um, there's something there's more crunchy crunchiness in there yeah that's that's true and again i i think it's really good for younger audiences but for adult i i just don't think that this one is enjoyable in the same way that the first one was um i also really quickly i know i'm going along i apologize i watched uh inside lewin davis which i'd seen theatrically in 2013 when it came out the coen brothers movie that stars uh, oscar isaac and i had not seen it since then my wife had never seen it and i just uh, threw it into my old netflix disc queue and it uh it got delivered this past weekend and we watched it and I like this movie a lot more on second viewing than I did the first time. I think I was sort of confused and like, you know, I, I couldn't really get a read on the film the first time I saw it. But watching it the second time and knowing its rhythms and knowing sort of what is going to happen, it made me uh, appreciate a lot of the smaller details in it. And and I think Oscar Isaac is tremendous in the part. I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on here that I, I couldn't for the life of me, understand what was happening with the Gorefinds cat the first time through, but I think I have a theory about it now, this time, where I feel like it's it's commenting on Lewin's journey himself instead of being like this uh, this um, MacGuffin or something that he's after, which I, I sort of viewed it the first time around as, as that. Uh, but yeah, the music is really good. I would just recommend to anybody, if you haven't seen this one, uh, check it out. It's I think it's one of the Coen brothers' most interesting movies, for sure. Um, and then finally, I watched this movie called The Ghost Goes West, which is from 1935. This one was on TCM, and I DVR'd it. And uh, the, basically, the reason I DVR'd it was because it was like the the synopsis was like uh, something about how an American millionaire uh, moves a Scottish castle brick by brick to Florida, but the castle is haunted, and the the ghost comes along with it, or something like that. And I was like, "Well, this I gotta see." Wait, 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 and, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> When was this made? What is this? This was this was made in 1935, and it starred Robert Donat. Donat. I, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce his name, but he was the guy who was in um, like uh, the 39 Steps, the Hitchcock movie. He was in Goodbye, Mr. Chips. He won an Oscar for that. Um, he's he's been in a ton of stuff, but this this movie. Uh, he was also in uh, The Count of Monte Cristo. I think two years before this. Um, but uh, yeah, this movie is goofy as hell. It is. Uh, I was expecting. I was really hoping that with a title like The Ghost Goes West, it was a little bit more ridiculous than it actually ended up being. I think it's it's fine. And sort of like The Quiet Man, you can definitely see um, shades of modern romantic comedies or I guess the romantic comedies of like the 90s in there, like the 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 seeds of the tropes and stuff like that that would form the basis for a lot of those movies. You can see a lot of those things in there as well. Um, you know, like a screwball I guess, comedy. Kind yeah. Of thing. Yeah, exactly. Like uh bring up baby and all that kind of stuff. This is sort of like a contemporary for, for one of those movies. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and Robert Donat plays uh, 
a human character and the ghost, the titular ghost who goes west. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I would recommend this to anybody, but the premise alone uh, sold me on it. And I guess I was I was slightly disappointed just because I, I wanted it to be even more ridiculous than it ended up being. Yeah, the premise sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, a movie that I was supposed to see this past week was The Grinch, and my screening was coming up, and I was like, you know, I just don't want to drive, you know, across the city. To go see. I've been so lazy this week. But HT, you did get to see this movie. This is one of the things that you actually did get to do uh, beyond moving this week. Yes. How is and it? I even wrote a review of it, too. <laughs> It's fine. It definitely is not worth driving across town for to see it. So you you saved yourself a little bit of pain. I mean, it's not it's not bad. So it, as far as like Dr. Seuss adaptations go, it is true to the spirit of the Dr. Seuss story. It uh, stars Benedict Cumberbatch as the titular Grinch in a sort of more modern um, remake of the of the ca- classic. Christmas character. So he's he's a curmudgeon, but also he's a kind of a tragic character who suffers maybe from depression and maybe some sort of form of mental illness. And that is a little interesting. But a lot of this movie is spent in these little vignettes that are kind of reminiscent of like, like Wallace and Gromit type antics, but much more boring. I don't know. I, I for some reason like this is a movie that, despite having so many things thrown at you and being so bright and colorful and uh, round and sweet looking, is kind of boring. Which is so, something that I um, especially don't like in animated films because there's so many things you can do with it. Again, and um, I think the biggest sin that a, a, a film like this that's made for families and for children is that it can be is to be boring. And I ended up nodding off a few times, actually, which is very odd for me. There, I, I think I woke up during a scene where, like, uh, the Grinch <laughs> was twerking or something. <laughs> of course. Of course. Um, was uh, How does this compare to, like, the Ron Howard movie? Like, is, is this better, at least better than that? Okay, so this might be controversial, but I didn't mind the Ron Howard movie when I was I did grow up with it so I kind of am a little biased towards that film I actually Uh. owned the DVD for a while and I will say that the Ron Howard film isn't a good movie but it is more entertaining than this film interesting so Mm -hmm. I I guess this is another movie I don't need to see yeah, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, go out of my way to see it. It's fine. It's not. It's not as um, like offensive as I ex- anticipated to be. Like I mentioned the twerking scene, but there's really nothing that's like overly like ridiculous or nonsensical. But it's just so like in the middle. I guess you would say it's like it feels like all the the edges have been shaved off, and it's just this nice sort of sanded version of the of a how the grinch stole christmas story well we will link your review of the grinch in the show notes for everybody to read and uh let's move on to what we've been eating brad i know that you have collected a good sample of uh interesting edibles this week yes that's very true um so first of all i decided to uh please you by trying the peppermint bark oreos I, I'm so curious because I, I'm on a diet. I can't eat these peppermint bark uh, uh, Oreos. And I was wondering last week, what's the difference between those and the uh, the candy cane Oreos from last year? Uh, the, the, the peppermint flavor, because it's in the cream this time and it's not just peppermint uh, candy cane pieces inside regular Oreo cream, really make, make a difference. Um, it, it's kind of like eating – like a, a room temperature version of peppermint ice cream with Oreo cookie mixed in with it. <laughs> that, um, that doesn't sound like a good thing to eat. <laughs> it, it's, it, I mean, it's do you, like, uh, I guess another good, fair comparison too is like, have you ever had the Hershey's chocolate bar, the, the mint chocolate one with the cookie pieces in it? Yes. It's kind of like that. The, the mint flavor isn't as prominent, um, but it, it does have the, because of the kind of cookie that Her- Hershey's uses, which is similar to the Oreo cookie, it's a similar taste combination once you have the the cream with the cookie. So it's it's not my favorite um, or anything like that, but it's uh, they're they're pretty good. They're de- they're definitely better than the candy cane versions, I think. So is this a buy a pack, try one from a friend, or avoid? I would say 
probably try one from a friend uh, unless you happen to have a proclivity for you know the peppermint flavor and you're like oh man i just i just need some mint stuff right now um i think i think you can just try them from a friend probably i wake up every day saying oh boy i need some mint stuff right about now See? um what uh what else have you been eating brad so i also got my hands on one of the more ludicrous things that has come out this year um last week uh, Pringles announced that they were releasing a set of Thanksgiving inspired uh, chips or crisps, I guess they're they're called. Um, they did this last year, I think, where they they but it was only a very limited thing that they only sent to like some food bloggers and stuff like that. Uh, um, they sent uh, initially they sent like this tray that had a bunch of different Thanksgiving flavors that were like turkey and stuffing and pumpkin pie and cranberry and stuff like that. And last year's had a lot more, but this year they um, sold a, a limited edition box that included uh, three small cans of Pringles that are turkey, stuffing, and pumpkin pie. And they went on sale uh, last week at like at uh, midnight Eastern time on the Kellogg's website, and I was like, I have to try to get these to talk about them on the water cooler slash home daily. And I, and I was so curious. By the way, I love how that's your excuse, not that you don't want to try them. It's like, oh, I, I need to do it for work. I mean, I probably would have done it even without work, but <laughs> yeah, it does give me a good excuse. <laughs> um, so I, I got a hold of them. I was lucky to, actually, because – the the website I guess crashed a few times while people were trying to get them and a lot of people were mad overnight and even the next morning I saw where they were like what the heck I kept trying to get them and the website crashed so I uh, but I was lucky enough to get a hold of them they arrived this week and I tried them and they are pretty good um, the turkey one is the least satisfying because it's it tastes how turkey smells if that makes sense but it doesn't really Ew. taste much like turkey. Um, so it's not bad, but it's just the flavor, the, the flavor is not much different from just a regular Pringle. So I was just like, eh, whatever the stuffing one, however, uh, does taste like actual stuffing. Like it's almost as if they took, you know, uh, dry stuffing and the seasoning that comes in like a stovetop box and just like smashed it into a thin, you know, potato crisp. Um, because the, the seasoning flavor is there and the stuffing one is, is pretty close to, uh, stuffing, um, taste. And then the pumpkin pie one is a, is pretty good too. It's um it's got a hint of the pumpkin spice, so it's a, it's a little bit it's uh, a little bit sweet, and it's um got that that kind of cinnamon like flavor to it. it. It did remind me of they they released a cinnamon sugar uh, Pringle like a few years back as like a holiday flavor that I had tried, and there were there were some hints of that, but the the pumpkin flavor is definitely there, just like any other you know subtly pumpkin spice flavored thing that you would find around fall. Stuffing so, is my favorite part of Thanksgiving bread, but I, I don't think I understand the point of, you know, a stuffing flavored potato chip. I think it's just fun more than anything. I, I, I believe I think it's Trader Joe's that has like a, a I don't I think it's a turkey and stuffing chip that that is like it's like a seasonal thing they bring out. And I think it's out right now. So maybe you should try and seek those out if you if you can. I don't know if your diet will allow it. <laughs> well, uh, if people want to get a hold of these Thanksgiving Pringles, are they just screwed? Yeah, you're screwed. It is they they sold out quickly. They're gone. Um, if you want to check eBay, go ahead because uh, they're people are selling them out um, and they are going for well over the fifteen dollar price uh, that was charged by the Kellogg store. Um, they're selling for upwards of fifty dollars. I even saw some bids that were getting over a hundred dollars. Is it worth fifty dollars? Uh, if I paid fifty dollars for these chips, I would probably be crazy. So no. <laughs> okay, let, let's move on to what we've been playing. Uh, Brad, you've been playing a lot of this Ghostbusters world, which is, I guess, is like the Pokemon Go version of Ghostbusters. Yeah, and I actually haven't been playing a lot of it. I've been playing it intermittently, and it's only because. With Pokemon Go and Jurassic World Alive and now this, like that's three location-based creature ghost hunting games, and it's just, it's too much. It's too much. Like I've I've pulled back on Pokemon Go a little bit, even though they've just really recently recently released a whole new generation of Pokemon. I haven't even really dived into it yet. Um, I still play Jurassic World Alive every now and then, uh, simply because I I just want to get all the dinosaurs, and I'm I'm getting closer. Some of them are just harder once you get up to the higher levels because they require more and more DNA to be able to create them. Um, but the Ghostbusters world game is, is, is really fun. I've, I've captured a pretty good amount of ghosts. 
um, you know, it's uh, it's a little bit more complicated and involved than both Pokemon Go and Jurassic World Alive, just because there's a lot more stats to keep track of, and it's there's there's a story mode, and it, there's just I, I don't know, it's it's a little bit overwhelming for the for a game because I'm much more of a casual player when it comes to Pokemon Go and Jurassic World Alive, and it feels like with Ghostbusters World you have to pay a little bit more attention to what you're doing with your ghosts and how you use them. So I don't know. It's um, I like playing it, but I'm just not sure it's something that I have the time to dedicate to as, as a, uh, a mobile game, simply because I just don't usually do that kind of stuff when I'm out and about with my phone. Um, and I don't really feel like going out and about just to play Ghostbusters. <laughs> so it's definitely, it's definitely fun. I like the AR aspect of it because you actually have to point your phone around a certain space to be able to shoot your, um your proton uh stream at the ghost and capture it and so there, there's cool stuff in that in that respect but it's um yeah i don't know it's so it, it's it's fun but i'm not sure it's something that i'll play religiously i think it's very telling if a ghostbusters fanatic like you has not been sucked into uh the 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 ghost trap of this game i mean uh, don't get me wrong the, the game is is really fun but it's just i'm not that like in involved of a mobile gamer to really like play a game like that and spend that much time dedicated to it, you know? Well, I think most people are probably like you in that way. Um, Jacob, what have you been playing lately? Well, normally this is the part where I tell you how I'm doing in Red Dead Redemption 2 or Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, and nothing new to report. I'm playing them a lot, but nothing new to add from past few weeks. So I'm going to talk about some music that I've been making the rounds with uh, this past week. Uh, first of all, I started uh, re-listening to Lady Gaga's Joanne, her 2016 album, and I started listening to it again because I was listening to the Star Wars Born soundtrack, and Joanne feels like a warm-up for that movie and that soundtrack because it features three or four songs that are definitively country songs. You can't argue about it any way whatsoever. They are her doing country, uh, like really good country songs, but they're on an album where she's also doing um, songs that are like really grimy um club pop um some like throwback like british um british invasion sounding 60s sounds some like power ballads it's the album really feels like her trying to pull off as many genres of music as she possibly can and it's my favorite lady gaga album i think it was received kind of a mixed reception when it first came out but uh for me, it's it's just a powerhouse vocalist, someone who has so much imagination as a performer and an artist, just trying out so many new things, and it's so much fun. It's I've been listening to it pretty much nonstop. I, I think Lady Gaga is such an incredible talent, and if you're getting worn out by the Star Is Born soundtrack, uh, Joanne is exceptional, and the country songs on it are exceptional. There's even a song that's um an incredibly um lewd, <laughs> nasty. A uh, pop song about how much she wants to have sex with a cowboy. So Lady Gaga is definitely going through a country music thing <laughs> right now. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really good, and I feel like um, I, I feel like I feel like maybe not a people gave the credit it deserves for an album. I think is pretty tremendous. Uh, but speaking of cowboys and country music, I started uh, listening to uh, Marty Robbins's uh, Gunfighter Ballads and Trail Songs, and my mom had a uh, cassette version of this album back in the day. We'd listen to it all the time, like on road trips. And uh, Marty Robbins had a brief resurgence a few, a few years ago when his song El Paso was used in the uh, Breaking Bad finale. And this entire album, though, is just amazing. It's a 1959 album. It won the Grammy for Best uh, Western Country Western Album. And it just, it's just incredibly straightforward. Uh, Marty Robbins singing songs of gunslingers and cowboys who very frequently die and have bad things happen to them. But it's, it's completely honest and straightforward. Uh, it's just these um, songs that are like, there's no frills in them. It's, it's just, he's telling you a story. He's telling you a story about a gunfight gone wrong, or a guy who thinks he can tame a horse, but he can't, or a guy who sees Jesus when um, an apocalyptic rainstorm kills all his cows. It's just <laughs> all these um, really simple, straightforward, honestly performed country songs. And as someone who loves country, I, I love like Johnny Cash, um, uh, and I love for modern stuff like Nico Case or even <laughs> Lady Gaga doing country. Uh, I, I feel like the best country songs are just really good stories told very simply, and that's what a lot of modern that's why a lot of modern country's garbage is trying too hard to be pop music. Whereas uh, Marty Robbins is a good reminder that uh, country is at its best when it's just very simple stories of sad cowboys. Very cool. Uh... 
that brings us to the end of today's Slash Film Daily. You can find the the articles I mentioned uh, linked in the show notes. You can find this podcast, Slash Film Daily, published every weekday on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to peter at slash film.com. And uh, please go rate and read this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends. Spread the word. And we will see you tomorrow. Hey, hey, Peter, I need you to pick a number between 1 and 406. Oh, no. Wait, wait, is it... It's your birthday. It, you yeah, have to. It, <laughs> wait, is there a birthday uh, section? A section of birthday jokes in this book? Oh, I don't know. I was going to have to pick a page. Uh, let's see. Jokes, quote, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, yes, there, there is a birthday section. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Ha- have, have at it, Jacob. Okay. <laughs> Um, let's see. I opened the random page in the birthday section. Spelled the Z, so it's birthdays. Um, <laughs> off to a great yeah. start. <laughs> uh, Peter claims he's uh, just turned thirty. It must have been a U-turn. Uh, I mean, I guess. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> Hey, HT, no more candles for your birthday cake. On your last birthday, the candles look like a prairie fire. <laughs> Wait, I don't even get that one. It means I'm old, uh, which doesn't make sense because I'm the baby here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Brad never really lies about his age. He simply says he's as old as his, as his significant other. And then, uh, and then he lies about his age. What? <laughs> what? Take that. <laughs> wait, 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 wait! I don't even understand that one either. Well, He's as old as his significant other. Yeah, well, I, I, I had to gender swap it because it's it's very it's, it's red as a woman, but I had to gender swap it for Brad, and oh. Brad's not married, so I had to change it. You guys, I don't prepare this. Open up the page and I start reading. <laughs> All right, uh, Chris, um, mm-hmm. every uh, you claim you're approaching thirty-five. <laughs> Everybody wonders from which direction. Oh no no! Is all these like thirty jo- somethings. All these jokes are about like lying about your age. Uh, hey Ben, your youth has changed from the present tense to pretense. <laughs> Take that. Yep. I, I got got. I uh, <laughs> yeah. I Jacob, I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't I don't know about this book. <laughs> I, don't know, I think we need to do a few more weeks of research to figure out for sure. I feel <laughs> what we need to do, Jacob, I'm going to give you assignments okay. for next week. I want you to go through this book and find what you think is the funniest joke, you know, within. I'm sure you're probably only going to go a few pages, but <laughs> I, I, I want the funniest five jokes that you can actually find. All right. Well, or or the worst. Actually, I don't know. I well, guess Peter, a mix of the the worst and funniest. I will meet your assignment with it with an insult from page seventy. Okay, you have a difficulty for every solution. Th- that's it. <laughs> yes, that's it. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yeah, okay. so this is some, some real bodied stuff there. Go see bodied <laughs> or listen to this podcast. Okay, so that's how it's going to end, right? That's how the uh, the podcast is ending. I think so. Yeah. I hope so. Happy birthday, Peter. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy Peter. birthday. Happy birthday.